All right, come on in. Where is everybody? Wait, we get to about 500. We'll get serious. We're, we're watching the animals here compete. This is my dog Snickers, making sure that my cat doesn't get anywhere near her dish. It's going to be great. <laughs> Hello, Las Vegas. Let's see if we can turn. Idaho, Vancouver, Edmonton, Chicago, coming in from everywhere. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Live periscoping. So we're gonna go out to my uh, man cave in the garage. As soon as this, as soon as this coffee's ready, I'm gonna talk about North Korea. But it turns out that my coffee maker did not work. So I'm going to throw away this coffee. And we're just going to go talk about North Korea. Come with me. We're going out to the, uh, going out to the garage. All right. So I've, uh, I've created some, uh, some maps here. There's a new Al Gore movie. All right, so here's my map of the situation. You got China up here, then you got North Korea here, South Korea there, you got the DMZ in between, and you've got our armada sitting off shore, and there's their capital. Pyongyang, and there's all their artillery set up to destroy South Korea should we do anything militarily. So I wanted to walk through this with you because when people talk about us uh, attacking North Korea, I always wonder what that would look like. Now, I'm hoping we don't do this because it sounds like uh, it'll be quite a problem. But in order for us to negotiate a deal, in which um, North Korea does whatever we want them to do, they're going to have to think we really can do this, or that we're, we're, we're willing to do it. Uh, the Armada is on the wrong side of the peninsula? Yeah, for now. But if, if, stuff, if the stuff went down, who knows where they'd be? But you're right, I think, it's, I think the Armada is probably on the wrong side here. Um, so here's what people say. Now, I'm going to turn the camera around so that you don't have backwards writing. Experts are telling us that if North Korea decides to launch something and we were to, let's say, uh, send some missiles their way or try to punish them militarily, that their artillery that they've set up all along the border, presumably it's somewhere near the border, would rain down on South Korea and it would be so terrible that um, South Korea would be in bad shape. Now, it seems to me that in order to make a credible, um, a credible threat against North Korea militarily, you'd have to have some kind of response to what about all that artillery? And so here's the question. If North Korea decided to launch something that we didn't like, let's say it was another test of an inter intercontinental you know, ICBM or something like that, um, and suppose we decided to respond militarily, Let's say that because North Korea doesn't have a lot of technology and infrastructure and stuff, and a lot of it's concentrated in a few places, such as the capital, and there might be a few other places, but you know, we pretty much would know where their command and control was. We kind of know where their dear leader was. We kind of know where all their, um, I would think, their power grid is. So imagine, if you will, that on day one we put an EMP above Pyongyang, Pyongyang and wherever they have other important infrastructure and just take it out. So this is a question, not a suggestion. What happens with all the artillery the moment they lose complete com uh, communication with the boss? Do these folks have uh, orders that say, if, if you can't communicate, start firing? Well, maybe. They might. That's possible. But 
would you do it just because your phone wasn't working? You know, if the only thing you knew is that your phone didn't work, would you say, well, now I better launch all my weapons? And what about these, this artillery? Is any part of that electronic? Because <laughs> if it is, maybe we can take some of that down too. But now the problem with getting to this, all this artillery is that there's lots of it and it's dug in. And even if you knew where it was, it'd be hard to bomb. But in order to fire, it seems like they have to come out. In other words, as soon as they fire, our satellite would pick up, oh, there's exactly where it is. And it seems to me that we have this technology now where we can uh, launch a bunch of tomahawks and have them actually circle an area <laughs> for a while. So, so the tomahawks would be launched. They'd just sort of be circling. And as soon as the satellite says, ah, there's a flash, gone. So I don't know how much artillery they have to imagine that we could get with all of our weapons. Yeah, the tomahawks are slow. If they started firing, couldn't we, uh, couldn't we uh, get most of their artillery once they revealed themselves by firing? Just a question. Um, now, obviously, I don't know what, what weapons the United States has, uh, you know, the secret stuff, the new stuff. And so none of this is a recommendation, and none of this, none of this is a prediction. I'm just, uh, I'm just sort of, uh, you know, writing up the, the, the only way I could see it being feasible is if we took out their command and control with an EMP or mother of all bombs or whatever it takes. You wouldn't want to kill all the civilians here. But um, if you knocked out their communication, which feels like that could be an easier job, what would happen with all this artillery? You know, would it, would it just, uh, would it just wait? Or would they say, thank God, somebody killed our leader. Now we can, you know, let's walk away. Don't know. Uh, they're so sold it's not vulnerable to an EMP. Well, maybe they are brainwashed. So here, here's some things that we always say in the United States, but who knows how true it is. We always say that the leader of North Korea is crazy, but you know, you talk to people who know what they're talking about and they kind of say, well, he might not be so crazy as he is shrewd because the stuff he's doing is working, you know, at least you know, in this context. So I don't think their leader is crazy and I would likewise doubt the degree to which their population is brainwashed. Now, obviously, there's plenty of brainwashing going on there, and it's it's not nothing. But if you're in, if you're the general in charge of the uh, in charge of the artillery, and you just you just and you think you just lost your dear leader and all of your leadership above you, is the first thing you're going to think, hey, let's start a war with South Korea? <laughs> Probably not. First thing you're going to think if you're the, one of the generals left over, who is in charge of the artillery, is Hey, if the dear leader's gone, I might be in charge. Maybe I better look into this. I might be running this country now. And the last thing I want to do is lob some artillery where I'm going to be dead in a day. So, yeah, the generals and everybody else, they might be brainwashed. But the moment the dear leader is gone, they have to reassess you know, their situation. And if you're a general and you're left over after the, the dear leader is gone... You're probably thinking, the last thing I want is a war because I'm sort of in charge now. Yeah, it's sort of an Alexander Haig situation. So we might get a worse leader. That's possible. But it seems to me that the last thing they would do is start firing their weapons once the dear leader was gone. More likely his own generals take him out? Maybe. Maybe. So I saw I tweeted a uh, link today that was talking about um, Russia saying that uh, Russia supported uh, some kind of a deal where China and North Korea would uh, agree to that North Korea would stop their nuclear testing uh, if the United States stopped its war games in that area. 
And I was thinking to myself, you know, in the past, that probably wasn't enough to work with. But I'll bet with our current deal-making president and the current situation, um, it probably is enough to work with. Uh, Sell you my book? What? Um, you wouldn't trust North Korea. Well, you probably don't have to trust them. Any deal we make would require some kind of verification. All right. Anything else happening today? Running at Swalwell. Oh, that would be interesting, wouldn't it? I would hate to have that job, but I'm pretty sure I could beat him in a straight-up election. Um, Eric Swalwell is the... Uh, Congress person from this area. Go to Pete's, bro. Why would I go to Pete's? Am I still trying to become the most credible person? I'm already there. Yes, the New York Times published a climate skeptic um, article. I'm not sure I would call him a skeptic because... Uh, the whole point of the article is that he was in complete agreement with the consensus. That's the opposite of a skeptic. All he did was give us more information. He gave us context. The article that you haven't seen, if you haven't seen it, I tweeted it this morning so you can go look at it. Hold on a second. The article uh, <coughs> essentially said, and by the way, I, I, somebody immediately tweeted a, a, a counterpoint to that, so I don't know if this is true yet, but... Let's say it was published in the New York Times, you know, today or yesterday. Um, No, was it in the New York Times? Yeah, so there was one in the Spectator and one in the New York Times, but I think it was the Spectator, which was the one that said um, that the consensus of climate experts is that climate change has been positive for the economy and for the planet so far, and that their their estimates are that it will continue to be uh, positive for possibly decades <clears throat> before the balance would change and become negative. Now, I don't know if that's true or false, but the claim is that that's actually the consensus of opinion. <laughs> now, you add that to the fact that uh, also in the news today, it's sort of a weird coincidence this all came out today, uh, there was an article saying that there was a study of the Middle East, and they found that the level of pollution just you know dropped substantially because of all the turmoil and, and war and stuff. And so we we have seen that humans can you know radically and quickly change the atmosphere if they really 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 need to, and there's no choice. So in several <clears throat> several decades, imagine what our technology will be. You know what can we do then? Can we talk about AI? What's to talk about? Practice ping pong? What? Oh, you see my ping pong table? <laughs> yeah. I'm using it as a, a workbench now. I'm just using the bottom part of the work, the, the table as my work surface when I do garage projects. Two sentences you would say to Kim to persuade him to our side. I don't know that I could do that in your artificial constraint of two sentences. Did you make up the term 4D chess? I made up the term uh, 3D chess. And then people who were mocking me and or extending the thought said, hey, this is 4D chess, this is 20D chess. Yeah, so you'll see a lot of articles now that are talking about, you know, 10D chess and 12D chess. Some of them are sarcastic literally making fun of me, uh, and 4chan made up 4D chess? Well, maybe. <laughs> if they're parodying you, it means you're relevant, of course. Yeah, I've been getting a lot of uh, feedback about my calming voice. You've been working on AI. Cool. Cool. Yeah, everybody's right. I, I'm not the one who made up the idea of three-dimensional chess or multi-dimensional chess. I'm not claiming I made that idea up. That's, that's, of course, 
decades old. Uh, but applying it to Trump in terms of uh, his persuasive powers, I'm pretty sure I was the first one to start referring to it as 3D chess when everybody else thought he was just a crazy clown. Does Trump have a poor economy of words? Trump has an amazing power of words. Um, <laughs> I have a Bob Ross-like common voice. Is your sex junk? So, oh, oh, oh. Yeah, that's the Bill Nye reference. Uh, listen to his NRA speech. I did not. Uh, is gender a social construct? Partly. It turns into uh, word thinking as soon as you start saying, is gender a social construct or genetic? You end up just you know, arguing over definitions. Stuff flying everywhere. Do I know Dr. Jordan Peterson? No, but I do know that I'm asked that question three to five times every time I turn on Periscope. Not that I know him personally, but people ask me if I'm familiar with his work, and the answer is no. Uh, What's your opinion on postmodernism? No, I have one. Do you think he uh, really gives that much thought of persuasion into his tweets? Of course he does. Yeah, yeah. No, the president is not doing any of this randomly. Uh, in fact, his most recent tweet I called out as just about a perfect tweet, persuasion-wise. It's the one he was talking about, uh, North Korea launching their latest, their latest uh, missile. Do you know Charles Murray? No. I mean, I know of him. My plans today, working, exercise, hanging out with Christina... My usual work, exercise, hang out with Christina. Those are all my favorite things, by the way. Um, <laughs> what kind of exercise? I usually do weights and some kind of cardio. Lately, I'm hooked on the stair machines because it's exactly the motion that you know you most need. Uh, 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 I am your ASMR. I will put you to sleep so fast. 50 push-ups. I can do 50 push-ups. Um, but I would save that for a bet. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I can get somebody to bet me that I can't do 50 push-ups. So I don't want to do it. <laughs> I don't want to do it because I can make some money later. Now, push-ups, um, or at least the push-up machine, as well as regular push-ups, are a staple of my workout regimen. <laughs> That's right. How many of you think I could do 50 push-ups? Let's see if I could win any money. Not today. I'm not going to do it today. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, you know, I wouldn't say it unless I could. Or maybe I would. Maybe I would say it even if I couldn't, but probably not. All at one time? Yeah. <laughs> no, spread out over 50 days. Yeah, my my voice will put you to sleep so fast. Uh... <laughs> Trinidad, I have never been there. Yeah, I'm going to do the writing video. Um, I still have a technical problem I haven't worked out. I might work on that a little bit today. But I have the uh, slides worked out and the, the lesson worked out. So I'm ready to go. I just need to broadcast. I might just say screw it and just do it on Periscope. I wanted to put it on YouTube so it would last a little bit and have more, uh, more uh, sharing possibilities. Let's bet you cannot do 100. I cannot do 100. Uh, 
Um, was your system to focus on other work instead of being on Periscope? <laughs> Apparently, I don't have a good system for that. Um, yeah, 50 push ups is not easy. Isn't Periscope forever now? Yeah, but the quality isn't good. Um, I'm looking for a better quality and a better platform. I mean, I could just do it on Periscope and then just save it to YouTube, but I don't like the quality that comes out of that. Do I like shrooms? I've only done them once when I was a young man. Best day of my life, which I say with no, with no exaggeration whatsoever. <laughs> It's so good you don't want to do it twice, if you know what I mean. It would be really easy to only want to do that. Do you ever echo people's words for persuasion? Yes. What future housing projects? Well, I'm always thinking about that. That's sort of my mental hobby, thinking about future housing and how to bring the cost down. Unify Korea. I'm not sure that's a good idea. Why, why is it that everybody says that that's something that needs to be done? It, it feels kind of racist, <laughs> frankly, because what's the big deal about the fact that their ethnicity is the same in the north as the south of that peninsula? Why, why is that important to us? Why is it important to them? East and west. Do you ever despair never begetting a son? Um, I've never thought of it in terms of a son. I sometimes think, hey, I should have spread my genetic seed far and wide. And then I think, why? Why? <laughs> There's just no good reason. I'll be dead. I'll bring people into the world to suffer. Why should I have kids? You know, what's different in my situation is that I, I think we have a natural impulse to want to, you know, um, be immortal, essentially. And you do that by having children who have children. So the part of you, your, at least your genes, some part of them become um, immortal. But I have, a, I have a strange situation, and you're, you're engaged in it right now, which is I put so much content on the Internet, which will probably live forever, that I'm sort of already immortal. And I do plan to live long enough that I can transport my personality into a machine um, to be truly immortal or close to it. <laughs> How much do you tip the bellman at the hotel? Usually 20 bucks for... Um, Two to four bags. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so President Obama is having some big paydays, $400,000 for giving some speeches. Um, I have a number of reactions to that. My first reaction is, great, he's just raising the price for top speakers. <laughs> you know, as long as the market for uh, high-cost speaking looks really high, then should I ever get another speaking a deal, <laughs> speaking offer, which I haven't gotten. Uh, I haven't gotten one that actually uh, closed since I started writing about Trump over a year ago. <clears throat> but if I ever get back into it, it's good to know that the market uh, can support that kind of a price. You know, obviously I wouldn't get that price, but it helps. Do you think genetics play a large role in IQ and success? Is there anybody who doesn't? I didn't know that that was a controversial question. Um, <laughs> How do you persuade yourself to start getting up earlier in the morning? Well, I, did, I never did. I didn't persuade myself to start doing it. I did it out of necessity and discovered I liked... I like that time of day better than all the other times of days put together. I mean, I like the first four hours of the morning, as in just in terms of time of day, far better than the rest of the day. And the rest of the day is great. I have, a, I have an amazingly good life. I'm just saying that the morning is spectacular. And if you can actually get up and get going and get your coffee at 4 a.m., 
amazing. It, it really is like a different life. But, you know, some people are morning people, and I'm one of them. I just, I just discovered that I was a morning person by accident, you know, early in my life. I was glad I discovered that. Yeah, I don't usually get up at 4 a.m. Um, I stopped using an alarm clock um, a few years ago. But I often wake up at 4 a.m. and just go to work. I go to bed whenever I feel like it, anywhere between usually usually around 11, give or take an hour. I try to give five hours of sleep. That, that was, so far, that seems enough to function and do everything I do. Um, I doubt it's completely healthy to sleep that little, but uh, I'm also in <laughs> insanely good health, um, high energy, and amazingly productive. Um, I don't nap, no, I just don't need it. Did I always sleep that little? Um, as an adult, yeah. Would you ever move from California? I would, in the right in the right conditions, which do not exist right now. Uh, you missed my whole North Korea talk. Can you walk on water? If I walk really fast. Uh, I walk on water every time I walk on a sidewalk that's wet. Yeah, ice. Have you ever read Dianetics? I have, yes. Um, L. Ron Hubbard, Dianetics, all that, is persuasion. It's hypnosis. It's, uh, it's not even well, well disguised. That's why it's so powerful. It's very powerful. It's, it's well done persuasion. I am not a Scientologist. <laughs> Thoughts on black people. What the hell kind of a <clears throat> question is that in the year 2017? <laughs> Do you have any thoughts on black people? <laughs> uh, I'll tell you my, uh, my, my thought experiment for you to answer that question, actually. Suppose somebody said to you uh, that you need to spend the next, let's say, 30 minutes talking to a stranger. And the only thing you can know in advance, the only thing you could choose is which stranger you're going to be with. But the only criteria you know is their race. That's all you know. You don't know anything else. Um, and you have to spend a half an hour with this stranger. And so you get to pick who it is just based on race. I pick black. I'm going to pick black every time. And the reason is <laughs> I've never met a black person who wasn't interesting. In part because their experience is different from mine. And in part, it's just a bias. I don't know. It's just my experience in life is that when I'm talking to some African-American person, it's just always more interesting, you know? And am I being prejudiced? Absolutely. I'm just telling you my experience that if you talk to the average, you know, uh, white guy with a stick up his ass, so how's your lawn? How about the weather? I work in a cubicle. I mean, you're just going to be bored to, bored to death. Uh, so if you tell me, you know, who can I talk to for half an hour that I haven't met before, I'm going black every time because I know I'm going to get a better story, more interesting. It's just going to be, it's just going to be more interesting. Um, have you read Reich, Robert Reich? Um, I don't know what in particular you mean. Do, do, do. <sighs> Thoughts on Indians? I don't think I should run down uh, all of the races and <laughs> give you an opinion. <laughs> but let, let's just say I, um, I might be the most open-minded person y you've literally ever met. Thoughts on racists? Um, do you ever meet Limbaugh? We're going into dangerous territory here. Uh, yeah, I call myself an ultra-liberal. I'll be waiting for your statements to be taken out of context. Yeah, it won't take long. Just wait. <laughs> All right. 
I'm going to take off now because I got stuff to do. I got a comic to draw. I have to draw a whole Sunday comic now. It takes a few hours. All right. Um, I will talk to all of you later. Thanks for joining me.